This is episode 68 of the Andrew Hines Real Estate Investing Podcast. Welcome to episode 68 of the Andrew Hines Real Estate Investing Podcast. Today I have Francois Lantier on the show and he is talking to us about investing in Ottawa, Cornwall, Ontario, as well as Moncton, New Brunswick. So he's got his hands into multiple pots. Francois invests for cash flow and he's doing very well. We dive deep into the numbers in this episode and it was really interesting to talk to him about the different markets he invests in, how each market performs in isolation and what each market has going for it in terms of economics and its political and geographic locations. Um, it was a really informative session. I really think that you're going to get a lot out of this. And what I was hoping that you would gain from this episode was really just a, a way of thinking about picking markets to invest in. I like that Francois had thought critically about each of his markets and why it made sense to be there and which ones he planned to be in the long term and then which ones were more of a shorter term play for him. Quick bit of housekeeping before we get into the episode. If you have not already, I'd really appreciate it if you could head on over to Apple Podcasts and leave me a review and let me know what you think of the show. It just helps it get into more people's hands. And if you think there's somebody that could benefit from listening to this show or this episode, please share it with them. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your continued loyalty to this podcast. Without further ado, please enjoy episode 68 with Francois Lantier. Hello and welcome to the Andrew Hines Real Estate Investing Podcast. I have Francois Lantier. I think I said that mostly right, but you can correct me if you'd like. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, it's hard. It's a hard name. So. <laughs> How do you say it? François Lantier. That sounds oh, much it's better. Similar. <laughs> Close as uh, I probably get. Okay. So uh, first off, thank you very much for coming on the show. My pleasure. I'm really excited to be uh, on the show. I've been listening to it for a while and it's very nice to be on. Yeah. So you reached out to me. I know you'd, you'd heard the podcast and you're in the Ottawa area. Is that right? Yes, exactly. Okay. So I've only had one other guest from Ottawa, but why don't you just start off and tell me a little bit about yourself, what you do for work and what you're, uh, what you're doing in real estate. Yes. So it's my wife and I were a team. Um, we actually met in London where you studied as well. So we went to Fanshawe college and, uh, we studied interior design and we just fell in love with real estate and properties and houses. Uh, we've been working in that industry off and on like different different capacities and we built with that an expertise so my wife is the plumber at home uh, she can fix toilets and change showers and do really complicated um, plumbing changes and i'm not as handy but she is um, and then for real estate we just have a passion for properties so for the past 15 years we've been buying and selling houses we normally buy the ugly duckling on the street. Uh, we find a house that's kind of overlooked, uh, maybe unkempt, uh, a good candidate for wholesaling usually. And then we move in with the kids and everything and we all pitch in and fix it. So that's something we've done. And in the past five years, we've really ramped up our process. So now we do, we buy multiplexes. So we've bought some duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes. And now we're getting into uh, a lot bigger deals as well. Um, are these keepers or are these, uh, are these flips? Uh, keepers. So the houses, single family, they were more like what I call slow flips. So I would buy it, live in it for a year or two and then sell it and then buy a bigger one and so on and so forth. But the multifamilies we're keeping. So we like the cash flow. We want to keep that and just keep growing from there. Okay. So you said the houses started 15 years ago. So yes. you, guys, you guys both just had uh, kind of a bit of a passion for real estate, figured that'd be a good way to make, make a little bit of extra money, kind of go into the houses, move in and then sell and move up. Yes, exactly. Because people, we were looking at properties that sat on the market for a while and mm -hmm. the ones that had the beautiful blue tubs and the ones mm -hmm. that no one wanted just in just rough condition or something complicated. Like the very first one we bought, um, like in Ottawa, we get a lot of snow. So the garage was actually underneath with, um, like an incline driveway with no, um, no drain. So people were scared by that house. They did not want to buy it. They thought water would come in Had blue, beautiful blue tub, blue toilets. It was very nice, hot pink everywhere. Uh, so we bought it, we fixed it up and we ended up selling it for a profit. And then we went on from there. We bought other houses from um, like seniors that were not updating it, uh, things like that. So 
And you, you started doing that 15 years ago. So that, that decline driveway. So the driveway is facing towards the garage. It's one of those basement garages, right? Yeah, exactly. So, so in you- Southern Ontario, it might work, but in Eastern Ontario, where we, like last winter, we had a mild winter and we had maybe almost three meters of snow. That does not work. <laughs> not yeah. very good. So how long ago was that specific example? When did you do That's- that house? 2006. So 14 years oh. ago now. Okay. So you've been at it for a while. And when did you uh, graduate from Fanshawe? Uh, nine, uh, 2001. 2001. So yeah, there's a bit of a gap. We were tenants for a while. Um, quite young. I was 21 back then and just got married. And then we bought the first house with the baby on babies on the way. And yeah, 2006, that's when we started everything. And then we saw, um, like my wife was a stay at home mom for a while. And living on one income was very difficult. So she had to go back to work and that's how she got into plumbing and being a sales rep in plumbing. And anyway, it was a different adventure. Oh, so she's a plumber by trade, your wife? No, she's not a plumber by trade. She sold plumbing fixtures, but she learned a lot from the plumbers. So now when she goes into a place, she can assess the plumbing. Like she knows what to look for and plumbing stacks and all that. It's her expertise. (laughs) So is this your full-time gig? Like you guys just flip houses and, and burr properties or are you doing interior design as a business as well? Like what are you doing for uh, active income? So active income, I actually work for a retirement home. And again, it's kind of strategic. So I hear about a lot of off-market properties. Some uh, future residents move in to these beautiful places we can see in the back here. Um, so beautiful new apartments and they have to sell their houses and they need help. Uh, often there's a bit of a time crunch. Uh, they need to, to get out quickly. Their health is declining or they just need assistance. So that's my daytime job. And my wife is a facilities manager. So she looks after uh, a big cultural center, a French cultural center in Ottawa. So she's, uh, she looks after all the infrastructure and all that. And then as a sideline, we buy properties, but it's not really flips okay. now. It's more the multifamilies, joint venture. And we're okay. also buying in New Brunswick and different places. Yeah. You mentioned that to me before, and I was interested in that. Uh, and we're going to dig in a little bit deeper, but, um, you know, I'd like to get into this psychology of why people choose real estate investing. And I haven't really dug into that in a little while, but you said that you were, you were in a position where your wife was working from or was staying at home and you were working and that wasn't quite enough. Was there sort of like a breaking point? Okay, that's it. We got to figure something else out. Yes. Yeah, there was. Um, so I had a kind of a sad incident. My father had Lou Gehrig's disease and um, we wanted to help as well. So on top of all the financial kind of distress, well, not distress, we were doing okay. We're trying to put money away for retirement at some point. Uh, that's all gone now. It's all in properties and cash flowing. So, <laughs> uh, but my father, yeah, again was um, was dying, very ill, and I just I, I couldn't take it anymore. And and then my wife was at home, and then the kids, and then daycare costs so much. Uh, ends up costing as much as a, a job. She'd need to get a really high paying job to cover for daycare for two kids. And mm-hmm. so yeah, that's um, trying to remember about. Almost 10 years ago, that happened. So she took on a job working from home and the kids started going to school. So that kind of helped. And then that job was actually for a uh, a faucet and toilet manufacturer. And that's how she got into that whole plumbing, plumbing business. And that really helped us grow. Like we got good deals on products and it helped us with some of our, our fixes and flips. It's interesting. You've mentioned two angles already. You have an angle on, on hearing about off-market deals working in the retirement home, and she's got an angle on getting discount materials yes. because of her business. And I find that a lot of investors had some sort of an angle. And the ones that didn't went to meetup groups and met other people that had angles and learned you know learned about it from them. So uh, it's nice to, to see that you're able to make that work. Um, but just on the note of that, that kind of like psychological breaking point, because I think I can in a way relate to that. Like when I had so I got into real estate investing, but, um, you know, I had never really worked a full-time job as a career. Because <laughs> <laughs> I did briefly, I taught at Western for two years and then actually I went back and taught one more year. But other than that, I mean, it was just summer jobs and part-time jobs in high school and whatever. Um, 
I don't know. I just, it never really resonated with me. I didn't really like the idea that they were going to take all this tax off and I'd have like just this measly little paycheck come in every, uh, every week. So I always thought, Hey, you know what, if there was just that way, you know, that, that we could find something that would just pay for our bills. Did you notice like a big transition? Like that first flip, did that like change everything for you? And you're like, okay, this is what I'm doing. Um, Yes, because it was what we enjoyed. So there was the whole design aspect. Like I said, my wife and I, we love walking in and looking at the property. What can we do with this place for a budget? And we just love that. And I I actually kind of worked in the field. I did more commercial interiors. So this was residential, which is <laughs> what I, I enjoyed the most. And yeah, the money was good, but we weren't set up properly for the first few ones. So we got some taxes and things. It wasn't wasn't ideal so we learned quite a bit now in, in all these years and um yeah just uh seeing the potential so multifamily that's where i really saw the, the potential for recurring cash flow like yeah. flips you get that money but it's a one-off and then you have to repeat while if it's a multifamily, it just keeps yeah. coming in which is very good like early on when you were flipping back in like 2006 were you guys making like 20 or thirty thousand dollars a flip or more or less yeah yeah 20 or 30 which is i mean it helps but it's not that yeah. exciting and then we had to buy a new house and then again legal costs and all that and so then pay taxes just... on on all that yeah, yeah, it wasn't capital gains because it was our our main residence, but right. it's still, yeah, it wasn't great. So, right, I see. It's a lot of work for for what you put in, and then and then no, you know, you're just gonna have to do it again, and it doesn't really amount to as much. Uh, I, I can definitely relate there. I guess I I looked at it and I thought, well, how can I legally avoid taxes? And by yeah. keeping the property, you legally avoid taxes, and so all the all the increase in value in your property, you don't you're not paying anything on that. So that kind of a good motivation, uh, to not sell. This is why I often say to people don't sell. Um, yeah. you know, that's just my opinion in terms of, I'm not giving anyone advice, but that's just how I feel. So, um, anyways, why don't we, uh, we keep moving forward. So you're now into multifamily buildings, um, for context, what, what's your portfolio look like right now? What do you have in your portfolio right now? So we have a, uh, about a dozen doors. Some I say about because it's through joint venture partnerships. So I kind of count them as half if it's a half and half partnership. Okay. Uh, my name's not actually on title, but uh, like in my own personal name, we have six doors. So, well, my wife and my name, and then we have some under our corporation. So at first we were buying under our own name. Now we're getting more sophisticated and then, uh, yeah, joint venture partnerships. Okay, so twelve and, doors in total. Well, actually, more than that if you if you uh, count the JVs as a whole door. Yeah, you know, exactly. Them them. I kind of like that. That's a that's a very honest number that you're giving. Uh, yeah, so. that's it. I mean, it is what it is. It's half. So <laughs> yeah, but there, you know, I think that there's this flexing contest that people like to do with the real estate investing, and my doors don't sound impressive at all because I'm into like high end stuff that that costs a lot for every one door. Like well, I have one door that that would be approximately well before COVID maybe nine fifty to a million. Which so is, that'd be like 10 others. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> it's not really comparable, but yeah. uh, you know, it's everybody's strategy. So I, I think that uh, just on that note, like anyone listening, don't worry about where you are. Don't try and beef up your numbers. Like everyone's got a story. I've had people on this show with no properties. Um, yeah. Usually, usually at least one. Uh, but uh, yeah, so, so you're at 12 doors right now. Where are they all? Are they all Ottawa? You have, you mentioned, you have some in Moncton as well? Yeah, Moncton, New Brunswick. So those are all joint venture partnerships. And then okay. I own as well. I like smaller markets. So Ottawa is great. It's very hot, but you get appreciation. You also have to fight off a million other buyers. So mm -hmm. it's nice, but I like smaller markets. I also like Cornwall, Ontario. So it's a small city of about 50,000 people. Awesome for cash flow. I have a duplex there that we're going to turn into a triplex because it's zoned up to fourplex. And, and it's amazing, the cash flow there. I was, I was just shocked. And I have another property there. Uh, Ottawa, I've got my own house. And now I, I bought a new one on a ravine with a basement apartment. So that's my other strategy. Um, that's going to be your new house? You're going to move? Yeah, I'm going to move there. And we're putting in a basement apartment. So okay. we're, we're doing an experiment there. <laughs> have you ever done a basement conversion? No. So this one's going to be exciting. And worst case, I mean, we live in it. So we're just going to keep yeah. it. And 
converted back yeah. to a family room if needed so <laughs> if you really want to be frugal you can live in the basement and rent out the upstairs <laughs> yeah i'm not sure about my kids my son's bigger than me so i don't know oh like, really yeah. yeah 16 six foot one i'm like nah i don't <laughs> can't squeeze wow. into the basement <laughs> Wow. Okay. Crazy. Yeah. I, I, I can support that. Uh, that makes sense. I don't think my wife would put up with that either. So actually I know she no. would, So yeah, she's, I, I haven't even been able to get her on board with, uh, with house hacking. She hasn't, uh, she doesn't like the idea. Um, okay. So, so you've got two in Ottawa, you've got one in Cornwall, two in Cornwall, two in Cornwall. These are buildings. And then you have yes. how many buildings in Moncton? In Moncton, there's three in the like right now, and I have more in the works as well. So yeah. Joint ventures. Do you know Tyler Sellers? Uh, nope, I don't. So he was on episode. I don't know if you heard the the episode. Um, like two episodes ago, probably sixty five, I think. Um, yeah, he he invests in Moncton as well. Okay, and cool. uh, he's talking. He's got a, a, an investor group for Eastern Canada, which uh, might be of interest for you. Yes, um, absolutely. Just, just connecting with people out there, and I know he's got JV partners out there too. So uh, we'll network through the podcast. Um, yes. <laughs> anyways, okay. So what I meant to ask you before we kind of dive into some of these specific uh, properties and what their cash flows look like, uh, what. Um, what are you guys doing for renovations? Do you have a team that does the rentals for you or are you in there doing your own rentals? Are you even getting into rentals? Like, I know I kind of assumed you're doing Burr properties, but uh, why don't you tell me what you're doing exactly? Yeah. So like for Cornwall, cause it's from Ottawa, it's an hour drive. So it's not bad. I've done, I do the demolition. I'm not very handy. So demolition I can handle. <laughs> so like the, the one duplex we bought for my wife's uh, birthday last summer, that's going to be turned into a triplex. So we spent her birthday ripping out old carpets and tearing down some old cabinets, things like that. But then, yeah, we have a team that does the, the actual construction. Mm -hmm. We also get the kids involved. Uh, they're getting a share through our corporation at some point in the future. So I want them in there painting and ripping out things. And but the finishing, yeah, we have a team. And we also did some work in Hawkesbury. That was where we did some of our flips. That's a small town, again, an hour out of Ottawa. Mm -hmm. And we have a team there too. Uh, so I don't have any active properties, but I do have my team. And in Ottawa as well, we did a lot of, again, the demolition, but then a team comes in and does the, mm -hmm. the work, the finishing. Is this typically work that would require a permit or no? Uh, nope, nope. Very cosmetic. So we're not re like adding rooms. It's yeah, it's fairly straightforward. There's a kitchen. We remove it, put in a new kitchen. Uh, and are you, are you going back and refinancing with the bank? Like say you buy a property, uh, what's your strategy? Like uh, today, if you're, if you're looking at a new deal, what's the strategy? Um, I know people love the burr and refinancing right away, but because I do secondary markets, the appreciation is not quite the same. I know you can force appreciation yeah. and all that, but no, I, I'm not refinancing right away. Usually it's more okay. a year or two later. Okay. So where were the down payments coming from? Just money you saved up through, from work or were you from other refinances that were a few years back? Yeah, other refinances, uh, lines of credit. I have one that I, a property I love. It's a readvanceable mortgage. Mm -hmm. So there's a line of credit in it. And there's a second one as well attached to it. So I use that house to finance other projects and I just make sure my cash flow covers all those costs. And Good point. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to just expand on that for a second. So for anyone who's yeah. not familiar with that, like a readvanceable mortgage basically just means as you pay down every month, you, uh, you would likely have a line of credit in behind your mortgage. And if you pay off a thousand dollars on your mortgage, you now have another thousand dollars available on your line of credit. Uh, if you can get these, and there are implications So speak with your mortgage broker and I'm absolutely not getting, giving advice, but this is my <laughs> philosophy. If you can get them, uh, it's well worth it because like on one of my properties right now, now that the interest rates have dropped, I'm paying off like $1,500 a month on that line of credit. That's, that's a good chunk of money to have access to like, say something goes wrong. It's a good contingency fund. Uh, the only thing is I'm not completely sure is if the bank could ever lock it down if they choose. 
they know, could, they, yeah. Yeah, they probably could, even if I did nothing wrong, if they just think the market's taken a change. Uh, so, you know, there is a little bit of a vulnerability. So I still like having cash, but uh, it's definitely something that is worth taking advantage of. And uh, who knows, you know, maybe when this whole, uh, you know, COVID thing uh, does its damage and we see some prices and some higher price markets go, go down, there might be some opportunity there. And if you've got money available, uh, I doubt the banks are going to be very eager to lend at that point. So if yes. you've got the credit available, then you can use that. Um, on that note, uh, have you exercised any unique, you know, kind of tricks along the way, any, any specific strategies that have been helpful to you that, that you would want to share? Uh, well, again, that readvanceable mortgage has yeah. been like a huge thing. It's so good. Uh, and I, yeah, I really hope they don't crack down on those because Scotia bank, I just read before our, our interview, uh, 40%, they've increased their uh, bad loans by 40% in the past few months. So yeah, I don't think they're going to be issuing as many of those readvanceable mortgages. Unfortunately. Wow. Yeah. Okay, so when they call it a bad loan, so these are, does this include all the people who have deferred their mortgages? Do you think? I'm not sure. I would think so. I, yeah. I can't imagine 40% of their clients yeah. like defaulting. So it must include yeah. that part. So they're going to be a lot more stringent. Did you ask to defer any of your mortgages? No, I don't. I don't think it's a good idea at all. Like if, if you're stuck and you have to, yes, but I would look at deferring other things like property taxes. The cities have all issued. Yeah, you're okay. You can take your time. Like the city of Ottawa was very generous. Okay. The city of Cornwall was very generous. Moncton, I didn't check, but again, every city has been very good at deferring those parts. Uh, so that mortgage would be the last item for me to defer. So that'll be an interesting one because the cities are probably down on their revenue a lot right now. Yes. And uh, they, I don't believe cities have the ability to borrow. I believe that no. that's, yeah. So <laughs> if the they're not collecting, law, I think, yeah. provincially that they have to pass to, to allow for it. We should have that letter, uh, that law federally and provincially <laughs> for our for yeah. federal and provincial government too, uh, not to get political. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I was wondering about that too, um, with the property taxes, cause I could definitely see like it, it would be years before they would ever, um, I would think, I don't know this for sure. Cause I haven't tried it or pushed my luck, but I think it would be years before you get a tax sale before they would oh, force yeah. to sell your property. It'd be you'd quite have, a while. You'd have plenty of time. And given the circumstance, I think that that'd probably be easier to get away, uh, get away with, but just curious about your thoughts. Why wouldn't it be a good idea to go and ask the bank for, um, you know, the ability to defer your mortgage six months? Well, I've spoken, I, I have my own meetup group as well in Ottawa and I, I work with the, the right club in Burlington up your way as well. So I'm friends with one of the co-founders. He's one Sarah? of my mentors and no Daniel Saint-Jean. So oh, he's okay. not yeah. on podcasts and things as much, but he's more in Ottawa doing things with me Okay, <laughs> and other. And, um, yeah, I've spoken with him and all the mortgage brokers he knows and they've all said it's okay. It's, it's there, but it can affect your credit in the long run. So next time you go to apply, mm -hmm. they will see that you did defer your mortgage. So what happened? Were you laid off from work? So I find yeah. it might affect your ability to borrow in the future. And I, I don't want that. I'd rather yeah. avoid it and defer like yeah, property taxes or other items. So yeah. And, and realistically it's not and the cost is insane. Oh, well, yeah. You're going to increase your payment because they're just going to yeah. add it all on and, and re-amortize it over your re or So they're going to amortize the additional payments over your remaining life of your mortgage. So, um, I think like if you break things down when it comes to credit in terms of logic, like when, when a banker looks at a, at a credit report, they're looking for, does this make sense? Like, why would this person behave this way? And if there's no good yeah. reason, then they're kind of announcing, well, you know, they were just trying to take advantage. You know, that's not the end of the world. Like if I looked at somebody's credit bureau coming from the mortgage brokering world and I saw no late payments ever, but I saw that they had deferred their mortgage, I'd be like, well, they're yeah, optimistic. No but if they had yeah. a bunch of lates, late, 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 and then they deferred their mortgage. Now they're, we're seeing a pattern. So uh, I think that the real answer is going to come down to, it probably depends on everyone's individual circumstance. If you're yeah. a really squeaky clean credit wise, again, not giving advice, always speak with your professionals and, and, you know, do that before you make any decisions. But I would think that it, it comes down to a lot more what your behavior looks like. So, um, and I've been fortunate. All my tenants have paid everything. Yeah. I reached out to them. Everybody's good. Um, yeah. I even sent them a little gift card. I know times are tough. 
make sure you call me if something's going on. So everybody yeah. called and some even paid in advance just to say, you're a good landlord. We want to make sure you're paid. So this, this is awesome. <laughs> nice guy. Okay. Well tell me, tell me what you do then. Like it, it, so you send them gift cards. Like I haven't even asked you about how you manage your properties. So, uh, what are some of the things you're doing for management? Are you self-managing or are you, are you using a property manager? Uh, yeah, it's a combination. Okay. So, uh, like in Moncton, of course it's a little far. So, <laughs> I use property management, uh, Cornwall. I, I do it myself right now. Um, because it's, it's the two properties. So it's, it's easy uh, to get there. And, and then the tenants I know quite well, uh, one of them is a senior who looks after pretty much the building mm -hmm. looks after itself. Uh, but I do send them little cards and little notes once in a while, like how's it going. And I do have stopped by for insurance reasons as well to go and see what's going on uh, and i have my team so i do kind of like what you do for your construction so if they have pest control i know who to call if there's a plumber i can send my wife <laughs> or i can send a plumber depending on her schedule um so yeah i kind of manage that part myself but i find now with growth it's becoming more difficult so i agree with what i hear on other podcasts like as you grow you need to, to hire out and mm -hmm. get more property management. So. Most importantly, it's just not, it's not like I couldn't do these things, but I'm an hour and a half from my property. So, um, for me to go check on plumbing when I would get there and I would literally scratch my head and say, I don't know how to fix this. I mean, I can fix a toilet clog, but I'm not the expert. So for me, I'd rather build the numbers in and be more stringent on my criteria as to buying a property, uh, rather than make my numbers so tight that I got to go do all the work myself in order to make it work. That's sort of yeah. how I started out. But eventually as you go, like you can find ways of, of delegating that stuff, I think. Um, Absolutely. And that's like, my numbers are good enough. I could have property management. Mm -hmm. It's just, um, yeah, something I'm actually considering. Cause I had a call last week. I'm like, well, I don't know if I want to drive to Cornwall <laughs> anymore. So, so. I heard some good things about Cornwall. I know Mark Loeffler used to uh, invest up there. He was on the show, talked about that a little bit. Um, tell me a little bit about what your numbers look like up there. Yeah. So properties are very cheap. Like the first duplex I bought there in 2016, I paid $117,000. So okay. it's very inexpensive. Uh, but rents are very good as well. So, um, well, that one, the rents weren't so great. So it was underperforming. That's why the price was low. Uh, they were two one bedroom units uh -huh. and they were rented out for like one was 500 a month and the other one 475. That low. Yeah, oh. that was super cheap. So anyway, yeah, the first tenants on the first, on the second floor left. And then I was able to re-rent it for more. So it's not, not a huge deal, but this property, um, I was able to get that readvanceable mortgage on it and the line of credit. So I see it as a, a bit of a cash cow. I tell everybody yeah. it's awesome. So, well, if you, if you think about the fact that you, you have 975 in rent and you bought it, does that sound right between the two units? Yeah. So when you paid 117, Yes. So, oh, 110. Actually, they were asking 117. I paid 110. Sorry. Yeah. So, I mean, a lot of people talk about the 1% rule. You're it's almost quite, there. You're not quite there, but you're, you're at 88% or 0.88%. Sorry. Um, so that's still actually like quite good, even though it sounds low because you're buying at such a low price point. Uh, what's your rent now? Now I have 600 and 550. So I'm at more than I'm at about 1% rule now. Yeah. Now you're, you're just over 1%. Yeah. Just a bit over. So. Yeah. Okay. Did you have to put any money into that? I put in a little, uh, vinyl shed in the backyard and the tenant on the first floor wanted to redecorate. So I bought him some paint. That's about it. Uh, I changed the toilet. Okay. So, so, it's so very effectively nice. just maintenance, not, not nothing. Yeah. Nothing no renovations. Crazy. It was very good. Like it was the previous owner fixed it all up and it was mm -hmm. a great deal. Okay. So let's just break down your numbers on that deal, uh, to kind of see where you're looking. So you're at 11, uh, 1150 on rent. Uh, what do your taxes look like on that property? Again, Cornwall is a deal. Taxes are super low. I think it's about 1500 a year. So 1500 a year. Yeah. That's, that's not bad. And, uh, insurance on something like that. Are you around thousand or 
1100 uh yeah about 1200 i think 1150 right. yeah so maintenance i mean on something that cheap i would probably figure out about 10 percent maintenance at least just yeah that might not even cover it in fact it might even be a bit more like 15 percent. yeah they say more like 40 dollars a door in cornwall 40 to 60 it's more like a flat fee instead of a percentage yeah. because rents are so low that 10 percent yeah. is kind of ridiculous so 60 times two doors times 12 months would would equate to 1440 uh, yeah. and if I go at 10%, that's 1380. So, so maybe if, if you wanted to be really conservative in that area, you might even say like 12% maintenance or something like that. And then that yeah, would be I think so. even more, um, management wise, you're doing it yourself. Uh, yeah. so we'll just leave that empty. Do you have to do any lawn cutting, snow removal, garbage removal? No, the tenant on the first floor, it's part of the agreement. He gets to use the basement in exchange for cutting the lawn and doing the snow removal. And surprisingly enough, in Cornwall, it snows way less than in Ottawa for some reason. I think it's because of the St. Lawrence Seaway and it's just doesn't snow very much out there like it does, but yeah, a lot less than here. So, Do you have any utilities that you pay there? No, they pay all their own. And there's no common utilities. There's no, no, no septic like, tank. Are you on city sewer? Yeah. City sewer. It's oh, right yeah. in the city it's downtown. Uh, With a basement. I do have to pay water. You have Sorry. to pay water. Oh, you do have to pay water. Okay. So. Yes. That I do pay. So. All right. So, so you pay water. What's that work out to be? Uh, for both units for the year, I think it's about 1200. Okay. So 1200 for that. Any other costs that you pay there? So it's insurance, the mortgage, utilities uh yeah that's about it okay Property so management. well you don't you do the, your own management yeah that's there, it yeah. but i could yeah so if we wanted to calculate a cap rate uh for those of you not familiar with that uh dig back into the earlier episodes uh but uh so if we wanted to cal calculate a cap rate that's about seven and a half percent so not too shabby uh so on one hundred and ten thousand. uh investment if you're getting a mortgage at 80 percent, that would have been 80 000, 88 thousand 30 yeah. years were you about 3.5 percent or 3.3 and change 2.2.39 wow got a good deal yeah so it's dirt cheap and it's readvanceable and there's a line of credit and there's another unsecured there's like yeah. three anyway it's crazy i love that okay place. so you got I, i'm i'm seeing here 344 uh, dollars a month cash flow on something that you had a uh, total investment uh, paying Ontario land transfer and a 20% down payment. And I figured legal fees at about 1700 bucks. Uh, your return on investment on that is 43%. Yeah. And you didn't even have to do a burr. <laughs> no, I know that's it. And it's a super low, like very yeah. low investment. I have another mm -hmm. example if you want as well, it's a bit more expensive, but sure. Yeah. Well, much higher again in Cornwall. So it's a much bigger property. Um, that one's a duplex, but it's got a walkout basement where I can add a basement apartment next, well, in the next little while, uh, yeah. upstairs is three bedrooms yeah. and I'm renting it for 1100 a month. Okay. And then first floor is a two bedroom and I'm getting 1375 in rent. Okay. It's got hardwood floors and it's a bit nicer. Yeah. And I paid 265 for the property. 265 for that one. So let's see how those numbers shake out comparatively. So on that one, what are your taxes like? Uh, taxes again are fairly low. I'm just trying to remember. Uh, they're about 2000 a year. So it's very low 2200. Okay. 2200. And then are your, is your insurance roughly the same or a bit more on that? No. Yeah. Insurance is more on that one. Um, I'm paying 20, 2600. Yeah. And an, a note on insurance is not all insurance is equal. So everybody should, should, take a, an insurance quote you hear with a grain of salt because there's full replacement and then there's, there's declining value insurance policies that don't actually cover you consistently throughout. Uh, so definitely dig into that with your broker. Um, and you I like my it. insurance. It covers even for vacancy. So if someone yeah. like there's a few months, I, I even get covered the rent. I don't collect during that vacancy time. Oh, so I really great. enjoy that product. And as well, um, there's another nice feature. Um, I forget, but yeah, the vacancy one's very good. So if it's vacant, you have to be insured and also the rent that you lose. So, but does that not, not, uh, you're talking about just if you have a claim? No, if you, well, you could claim it. Yeah. So let's yeah. say it's vacant three, five, six months and it's causing me issues. Yeah. I could claim the rent I'm not getting. So 
Okay, but I'm I mean, sure there's I, a cost. But. Yeah, see, I'm I'm very hesitant to claim anything on insurance because I don't. Me want too. I never to claim out. anything, yeah. but it's there as a peace of mind. <laughs> there, if you need it. Um, okay, so you don't have management on that one either. Uh, maintenance, uh, I have a much higher number at twelve percent. So I could so I could just dumb that down a bit. Uh, so you. Um, let's see here. Well, this you said, one I'd say it's sixty bucks a door, so one hundred and twenty. I'm not which sure. works out to be about that fourteen forty we talked about uh, yeah. before. So we'll, we'll, that, well, that's approximately five percent. I personally don't like using that number because if a roof comes along, you just wiped yeah. out like you know five thousand dollars. Yeah. So I like to kind of build the life cycle maintenance into my number for maintenance, but, uh, everyone approaches it differently. So I, I'll just leave that alone for now. So water, uh, you're paying that there as well. Yes. So this one's higher, it's bigger and there's families living in there. So I'd say it's closer to 1800 a year for water. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, uh, any snow removal, garbage, lawn, lawn care, anything like that? No, the tenants do it as part okay. of their lease. Okay, so this one, I am seeing a higher cap rate. It looks like you have a cap rate of about 8.16% at a 265 yeah. purchase price. If you did an 80% mortgage, 30-year amortization, uh, 2.39 again or different? Yeah, uh, this one, no, this one I'm higher. I'm at 3.10, so I should refinance, but yeah. anyway. That one has some bigger cash flow though. So I'm seeing cash flow for you here of $898. Yeah, that's uh, it. So keeping in mind this number lies to us a little bit because uh life cycle maintenance isn't really being captured in that maintenance there. Um I still see a 45% return. So say if we wanted to jack that that maintenance number up a bit, um, you know, we might see that go down to lower 40. Like if I adjust, I got my spreadsheet up here. So even if I went to 15% maintenance on that, which is obviously um, much higher. You're still over 40% overall return. Yeah. And I, I bought it using other people's money. So this one was a lot of fun. I didn't put a penny in it. So explain how'd you do it's it? Great. Yeah. So I, like I said, I do some networking and I, anyway, there's, I met some people, a person wanted to invest some RSP money. Mm -hmm. So he provided the, uh, the deposit, and we just got the mortgage and, mm -hmm. And that's it. So I did pay for closing costs, but it, yeah. I didn't invest much of my money in it. So and he, does I, he have a second mortgage on your property now? He did for nine months. I paid him off with the uh, the cash flow and other items. Okay. So, so your down payment on that one, including land transfer, you would have needed about fifty three thousand dollars, or sorry, yeah. fifty seven thousand, uh, including everything. Does that sound about right? Yes. Okay. So you, okay. You just had a couple of sources plus the cash flow. You just paid them out. Yeah. Yeah. That's the power of other people's money. I know I've talked about some examples on the podcast of, you know, properties I've bought with using other people's money that have now turned into very six substantial, um, components to my net worth. So, uh, it's huge if you can do it. I mean, I would say that the time right now we're in, it doesn't feel like it's the best time to do that. Um, but, uh, it also heavily depends on your market. And that's why I've moved on to joint ventures mm -hmm. because I find people are more willing to invest right now as a partner, less as a lender, mm -hmm. but they can be the, the money partner. So I find, I found a lot of openings for that and Ottawa, it's all government workers. So very yeah. secure jobs. We're not too concerned here. <laughs> yeah. I, I think that they should take a pay cut until we're out of all this. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That'd be a good way to get back to work. If, uh, if we make them go down to half, half salary. Um, okay. So let's look at one of the Moncton properties. Uh, give me an example. Yeah. So, um, I, I have a five plex right now, um, that I'm use. I'm um, sorry. I'm working with a joint venture partner on it. So we paid 255 for a five plex mm -hmm. and the rents, uh, yeah, were, uh, the rents is about 800 per unit. So the rents are low. We're working on increasing rents, but that's where it kind of stands and it still cash flows. Well, that doesn't sound that low based on what you got it for. Yeah. If you have five units at 800 bucks, that's $4,000 a month. Um, remember we talked about the, uh, the 1% 1 rule. <laughs> yeah. Here we're more like 2% rule in Moncton. That's why that's, I really like Moncton. That's 3.6%. That's the highest I've even heard. In, in, yeah. That's the highest I've heard in Moncton. 
I, I, wow. Tyler was talking about like 2.5 or so. Um, but well, let's get into some of the fundamentals there. Cause I know you're going to have a higher property tax in Moncton. You're probably like yeah. $8,000 yeah, yeah. on that. Like it's 7,200. 7,200. Cause it's uh, the property taxes plus a 1.2% surtax for non non-occupant tax oh, okay. of some sort. If you're not in the province, right? No, or even is, in the province, uh, just as non-oc- long as you don't live in the building, then there's a, like a surtax for investors. Huh. Interesting. What's, uh, what's your insurance like on that one being a five flex insurance is actually fairly low. So about 2,800. Okay. And, uh, maintenance on that one. Um, I put away 5%. 5%, 5% works out to 2,400. Uh, so we'll, we'll play with that number. So I like to do more, but in your analysis, like anyone listening, like and if you want this spreadsheet, you can go to my website, andrew-heinz.com. Um, I have that. You can just enter your email and, and uh, get it sent to you. But uh, I like to perform sensitivity on numbers. Like I don't like, because numbers can lie, right? So, yes. you know, what practice what if? Well, what, what things are likely to change if anything's going to change? Is it likely that my utilities double next year? No. But is it likely that they go up by like, say, 20%? Yeah, that, that yes. could happen. Uh, taxes usually go up by like 3% a year. Uh, we don't have a guarantee on the number. But maintenance is like, okay, well, what happens if I get a furnace one year, a roof the next year, a sewer backup the next year. Now all of a sudden my 5% maintenance number doesn't look quite as good. Um, of course you could be the other side of the spectrum and go, everything goes your way. Complete luck or complete good fortune. (laughs) We won't call it luck. Um, but, uh, okay. So let's keep going through these numbers management. What are you paying there for management? So I have a special price because I'm part of a mentoring group. I get 7% for property management. So including re-renting. Yes. And does it include anything else or it's just uh, collecting rents and dealing with tenants and re-renting? Yeah. Collecting rents, dealing with tenants. And then they have a special price for like a, a handyman to go in and do some odd jobs. Yeah. So it's, it, you do have to pay for that. It's $25 an hour, but yeah, it kind of opens that door and it's, it's nice. They do project management and all that as well. Right. And that's where that, that maintenance figure comes in. Right. So yeah. you got to think, so at 5%, that's 2,400 a year across five units. You know, how much, how much do you have available per door per year? Um, like, I like to think of it like this. If like, if you had to repaint a unit in that building, that would what eat do you up think? most of that, <laughs> <laughs> like by the time you clean it out and paint that unit, you could spend $2,400 on one unit. Yeah. I mean, that'd be in a, a little bit, it depends on how big they are. Right. Like I've paid, you know, 2,600 for a, a small 1100 square foot house, like with an unfinished basement to have it repainted. Um, yeah. so you can definitely, um, spend money on paint because paint itself is expensive and then you've got the labor as well. So just something to keep in mind. Uh, for okay. Sure. Are you paying water there? Uh, water? Yes. But, uh, it's, um, water, it's very low. Like the rate, it's not like in Ontario, it's much cheaper. So I'd say it's about 1200. I don't have the number handy, but okay. Are you paying other utilities? No. So there's a coin op laundry, but it self finances and pays for the the lights and the halls and stuff. It kind of cancels itself out. Okay. And then they have separate meters for gas or they, no, they have electric heat out there, right? Electric, but uh, this one doesn't have gas, but another property I have there does have a yeah. gas furnace. So. Is that becoming more common to find gas in, in uh, New Brunswick now? Yeah. One thing that's happening more too, they're going with propane, which is very odd. Like here, people are getting rid of oil and propane. Mm-hmm. Now they're going back to propane because it's cheaper than natural gas out there. So. It's cheaper out there? Yeah. Oh, wow. yeah. Yeah. People are converting back, which is like counterintuitive for us here. But anyway. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you have both options, like I've seen that a lot in cottage country here, um, you know, people, because they don't have natural gas service available yeah. on certain roads, they just have a giant propane tank outside their house. Um, yeah, whatever you got to do to get heat. Uh, okay. Any other costs on that building? Um, so there's a pro- property management insurance, uh, the mortgage, uh, property taxes, what about um, snow, grass, garbage? Yeah. Snow, grass, garbage. So another thousand a year, not garbage. We pay up as part of the property taxes. So. Yeah. I, sometimes though, when you get into bigger buildings, you have to pay like a super to like, just to help coordinate and get it yeah. all out onto the road. Um, no five flex were, we're just okay. But I think when yeah. we get it to a six and up, then we might need that. Yeah. Really need to have some systems in place to make sure that that works smoothly. Uh, when you get yes. the multi units, uh, okay. Uh, talk to me about your mortgage on that. Like, well, first off, did you burr that property? Did you do any work or 
The biggest thing with that one, it was underperforming because the owner was paying utilities for everyone. And what's nice in New Brunswick, there's no landlord and tenant board. So if you don't have a lease, it's a 30 day notice and you cut out utilities and that's it. So that's pretty much what we did on that one. Wow, you're making Man. you're making New Brunswick sound really good to invest right now. Oh yeah, I love it. <laughs> but so, I'm sure there's other things. But anyway, for that part, that's really nice. And unfortunately, there there is some abuse. I did notice in other properties, uh, landlords leaving properties in disrepair and unacceptable things. I don't believe in being a slumlord. I think you need to provide a good place yeah. for a good rent, fair market rent. And, and I, I couldn't agree more. I want to attract a nice tenant. So I want to be a yeah. nice person. <laughs> you kind of get what you put out there. If you're not, if you're not nice Absolutely. and fair, of course there are some tenants, which I had to learn this lesson. The, the hard way is, is that it doesn't matter how nice you are to them. They're just not going to be good tenants. And yeah, I, I've exactly. dealt with that, but you learn how to, how to spot that the, the further you go along. Um, Absolutely. Okay. So, so looking at your numbers that you've provided here on a $255,000 purchase, I'm getting a cap rate of 11.78%, which is probably the highest cap rate. If I'm not mistaken, I've ever had on this show. Uh, wow, one, cool. one of the highest, if it's not <laughs> the highest, um, I don't always talk about cap rate. And again, guys, if you're not familiar with that, go back to the earlier episodes. We do talk about it a bit. Uh, and of course a Google search, uh, will help you with that one too. Okay. So let's talk about the mortgage. Yes. So did you go in 25% down or 5% down? At 20. Or 20% down? Sorry. Yes. Okay. So actually my joint venture partner on this one, uh, she went in for everything. She got the mortgage at 80% and 2.59. And incredible. then the 20% down, she also borrowed it. So it's 100% borrowed. Okay. Are you guys splitting the cost of the borrowed money on the, on the down payment? Yeah. So what's, so she would have borrowed, uh, approximately, uh, 55,000 or so. Yes. Okay. Out of so, her line of credit. Okay. So 55,000 on that and, uh, on her line of credit, approximately what interest rate was she at there? Uh, well, it's, it's prime plus half 0.5%. So she's at 2.95. I think she told me 2.95. 2.95. Yeah. yeah that's, now that everything's it's, adjusted. I mean, it's yeah. Variable. So yeah, well, we'll call it 3.5 then. Cause that's an yeah. average. Yeah. Before this change. So even still, after all that on a $255,000 property, your cash flow is $1,500 a month. Yeah, I know. We love it. <laughs> That's a cash cow. Um, okay. So, so we'll go back and perform sensitivity, but just looking at this, so you didn't have any renovations or did you? No, nothing. No. There is one unit that will need work and we know that's why yeah. the cash flow is there. We don't take it. We keep yeah. it aside. It's a smoker's unit. So we'll, we'll need a lot of paint. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Fair. Yeah. So if we figure, and, and I should have said this before, 4% appreciation rate is the one I was using to kind of comprise our return because our return is mortgage pay down pre appreciation and cash flow. Uh, so we could play with these numbers. So which ones are, you know, do we want to perform sensitivity on? I would say 4% in New Brunswick is too much. Um, yeah. I'd say more like two, two or three. Yeah. I would say two, uh, to be more conservative. Um, yeah. and so, so as you've, you've said it to me, that's about a 51% return on investment. Uh, which cool. is pretty wild. Uh, your total investment there. Well, actually your total investment was actually zero because you borrowed everything, but say hypoth yeah. that it, the hypothetical return on investment, if you hadn't borrowed that $55,000 down payment, uh, would have been 51%. So you take that out of the mix and, and your return is actually infinity. We can't even calculate it, but if we want to perform some sensitivity and say, well, what if maintenance ends up being a lot more than we think it is? Um, so we have 5%. So if I adjust that to be 15%, uh, your cash flow is still 1100 bucks. Um, and you know, even more like if, if we want to say, Hey, this building's going to need, you know, $10,000 every year, uh, approximately. So like a 20%, uh, reserve for maintenance, that's still a $928 cash flow, yeah. which at that rate, you're still 38% return on investment. Crazy. <laughs> for anyone who, who, whose head is spinning right now with, with all the numbers, just take a, a slower look through it. And then of course you can also use this exact spreadsheet and kind of plug in. Uh, the only thing I'll say is uh, just unhide the cells. If you're using my spreadsheet, just uh, have some cells are hidden. You might want to unhide some of them so you can see all the different, uh, uh, the different uh, numbers. Another okay. cost I did not mention is yeah. through the joint venture partnership, we, we get um, life insurance, term life insurance, just to be safe and okay. ensure the project continues. So that's actually paid for since we have that much cash flow. We put it in as an expense in our 
okay. our, uh, it's like minimal. It's like $25 a month for all of us. And, okay. So very, uh, very minimal amount to, to add in there. Um, yeah. Yeah. So if we wanted, we could add that in, I mean, that's not going to change these numbers, much, No. but, uh, okay. So real quick before we, uh, we kind of get to some closing thoughts, I'd like to know what your take is on the different markets. Like, what do you like about Moncton economically? Like as, as far as the area, what do you see as, you know, having like, where, where, where's, where's the benefit to being there long-term? Do you, are you afraid of things changing politically, economically, socially, anything like that? Yeah, I don't, I don't plan on being there super long. I do want to build equity and get more, uh, more money out of it. Um, what's nice about Moncton, there's a university and I think there's a college as well. The economy is booming. They're really, it's growing. It's a growing city. Um, and it's got a good tenant culture. So a lot of people do rent. Uh, Ottawa as well, there's a lot of rental. But where I live in the suburbs, it's really not as tenant friendly. So it's not a tenant culture people tend to own. So New Brunswick seems to be more rentals, which is good for a landlord. Uh, there's no landlord and tenant board. So that's amazing. <laughs> that's a huge political plus there. Um, yeah. Definitely but- like that. But I do see some some reason why the landlord and tenant board came into being in Ontario because there is some abuse in New Brunswick, which, well, I find that shameful. I think if you're a landlord, you should provide a good place. But anyway, um, the ones that I own and I, I work in, I will make sure those places are good and, and fit for you. Yeah. Um, yeah, small markets, I mean, there's space for growth, not, not as much competition, and the, the working relationships are quite nice. So you're working with people from smaller cities. They've got like a more laid back mm-hmm. and you get to know them more. Like it's not as rushed and busy. It's nice. Other than schooling, are you familiar with, uh, with the industries out there? Like what else they have? I mean, are they shipping or anything like that? Yeah, there's a lot of call centers because it's a bilingual city. So there's a lot of call centers for uh, big companies. Uh, healthcare as well. So for New Brunswick, I mean, it's one of the centers with the hospitals. Mm-hmm. Uh, some of my properties are close to hospitals, so it's very good for the tenant yeah. base again. Um, but yeah, there's not. Yeah. It's not like Toronto, like shipping or uh, like Montreal. I mean, with the port or Toronto with distribution because of the highway or or Ottawa mm-hmm. high tech and government. It's not like that. Yeah, so, it's kind of hard to pinpoint. Well, and and that's why you'll. See- see some of these smaller towns that are slightly less diverse economically will have higher cap rates, higher cash flow because more of all, risk. Yeah. You're taking, yeah, there's a certain amount of risk, risk versus return. Uh, and then of course, when, when it doesn't have the obvious drivers economically, people don't rush there like they do. Yeah. Uh, like Ottawa, they do into Toronto. like, yeah, Ottawa, Toronto. Yeah. Like, cause it's a very obvious diverse, um, you know, landscape. So, um, yeah, I could definitely understand that. I think you have to weigh no matter what, when you're making that investment decision, you have to weigh the For pros sure. and the cons of everywhere you're selecting to invest. Like some places they're dying economically, but the cash flow is so good. Good, you almost go in knowing full well that you're going to lose money on the purchase when you sell it. Like you're going to lose money against it, yeah. but you'll hopefully have made money on the cash flow. And that's happened to me. And again, not making recommendations here. Um, I actually don't recommend that. I think that that's a, you know, not, that's not my investment strategy, but I have done it by accident. <laughs> and I don't want to do it again. Uh, okay. So um, talk to me about Cornwall. What do you like there? So Cornwall, very cute uh, city. It was very depressed, very like it was a a paper mill town. So all kinds of paper mills and they all shut down and kind of like Hamilton when the the, uh, steel factories started shutting down, it was, it really hurt the city. So Cornwall is much smaller scale. When that big employer shut down, then they had some trouble and it was very poor, but it's right on the 401 American border, Quebec border. So it's in a really strategic triangle and people don't know it very much, but Cornwall is very bilingual as well. So there's tons of call centers and it's now uh, Walmart. It's the biggest distribution center, I think, in Eastern Canada for Walmart and Loblaw has just invested heavily in Cornwall again, big distribution center for Quebec, Ontario, and Eastern Canada. <laughs> and uh, there's another one. Oh, there's a lot of meat factories. So we hear a lot of bad stories right now with COVID, but 
meat processing in Cornwall is doing well. I know I have some tenants that work there and they're doing great. They're getting salary increases. And yeah, it's just very good. And the city has a good program to revitalize the city itself. Um, people from Toronto are flocking there. They're opening cute restaurants. There's all kinds mm -hmm. of new uh, not airbnb but some new small hotels and things so tourism it's it's just yeah. i'm seeing good things all over so and are, is there uh, is there boat access shipping access yeah it's right on the saint lawrence seaway yeah. so it's really nice there's beaches yeah. it's beautiful so lifestyle from a, like without doing any research on Cornwall, um, I will say that things that logically come to mind are you can you can reach it by ship, you can reach it by car because you're right on the 401. Train, uh, yeah, trains right on the main train route. Uh, it's close to Ottawa, close to Montreal, um, and yeah, there's a like big said, college there too, community yeah. college. Okay, I didn't know that. Okay, so uh, yeah, there's just so many reasons that you could think employers would want to come there. There's just so yes. many reasons, you know, it's central, it's, it's good for distribution, good for shipping. Uh, so those are the reasons in my head that would make a lot of sense to like that, that area it's still in Ontario. So if you're thinking politically, you know, you got to deal with all the Ontario yeah. stuff, but, uh, but, uh, definitely some pros and cons, uh, that I can see right off the hop to that. So definitely to me, it seems like the rents, uh, versus the purchase price are an opportunity there, you know, without yes. having done further research, it definitely looks like a solid opportunity. And something else that was interesting that most of your listeners might not be aware of, I'm actually Franco-Ontarian, so I'm Ontarian, but my first language is French. In Cornwall as well, there's a big French-speaking population. And during the last year, I'm not sure if it's going to happen anymore, but there's supposed to be a Franco-Ontarian university that's going to open up, and Cornwall was bidding for that. Oh, so if wow. that opened in Cornwall, that would be really amazing for student rentals and things because students from all over Ontario, believe it or not, that speak French, will move there and want to study there or study remotely and it's going to create some wealth. So I'm not sure with COVID how soon that will happen, but it is something that will happen, I think, at some point. Very interesting. Well, it sounds like a, like a good spot. You kind of got me curious about it uh, to want to look yeah. into it a bit more because I'm always, always like... I'm very critical on new markets, you know, cause I, I've been investing in a good one. I've always liked London, except now the prices just don't work um, as well, but uh, they're kind of coming down a little bit, I think. Uh, but yeah, I'm always looking at new markets. You know, what's the most balanced, well hedged um, area to invest in. And uh, you know, that definitely seems like one that's got some potential. So, um, okay. So before we, uh, we wrap up uh, Francois, if uh, people wanted to reach out to you, follow you, um, where do we send them? Uh, Instagram. So actually my wife and I, we have a lot of fun on our Instagram. So our uh, handle, I, I'll have to send it to you, but it's Francois underscore Jennifer underscore Latier. And uh, we do wine and real estate. So we, we're going to have some guests. We have some people that have offered to come on to our wine and real estate to share their favorite wine and their real estate tips and tricks. It's super short, very casual. Uh, we're really not TV stars or any, anything like that, but that's really fun. Uh, Facebook as well. So Francois M. Lantier, I'm on, uh, on Facebook. I'm very active there. I'm also very active on uh, LinkedIn. So that's about it. Uh, I'm okay. not on YouTube or anything. And we don't have, well, yeah. we have a website. It's uh, savvies.ca uh, because of our own meetup group in Ottawa. Yeah, well. you have a meetup group. Um, so I'll get you to send me the links, but, uh, t and, and a headshot for yourself as well. Um, sure. But yeah, so, so send me those links, but uh, tell me about uh, your meetup. Yeah, so it's very, uh, it's fairly new. We just started in January. So very, very okay. fresh. We had uh, three meetings, um, but we had some high profile guests like Mel and Dave Dupree. Okay. Um, so that was really fun. And then the Right Club is partnering up with us and helping us build awareness around the Ottawa meetup. Um, I'm also involved in other groups in Ottawa, like Oreo, that's the big, uh, like the, I guess, the biggest meetup in Ottawa. There's usually. Okay three or 400 people at the meetings. Um, but my own little meetup, we're about 50 to 60 people. We do virtual events right now. It's, uh, 
It's yeah. a lot of fun. And a lot 50 of to 60 is, is great. That That's doing well. Well, that's your virtual, right? Yeah, no, in that's, person as well. Person. So. That's fantastic for your first few. I think it took us a while to get to, to, get to 60. Um, yeah. You know, you're doing, you're doing really well. But it sounds like you're doing the right things and you're connecting with the right people. Uh, so you. anyone anyone up uh, Ottawa way, um, well, definitely reach out to Francois and uh, hopefully they can come to your meetup as well. When they, yes, when they resume, sure. right? Uh, I'm, a firm believer. <laughs> I'm a firm believer in, in, uh, in no new normal. I, I like shaking people's hands and I like dealing with people and I'm not ready to give up that on Canada. And I don't agree with, uh, with that notion. I think that we need to fight for our right to, to, uh, to continue to be, to be a community and to, to continue to network with fellow investors. So I'm looking forward to that and uh, I know we'll, we'll get back to that. So, um, Thank you very much for, for coming on the show, Francois. Any parting wisdom that you would like to uh, share with our listeners and viewers? So the biggest thing in real estate I find is taking action. I know a lot of people say it, but just just do it. <laughs> just do <laughs> like it. If analysis, paralysis, and all that will really kill you. You have to be active. Mm-hmm. Try things, try small things, but get yeah. out of your comfort zone. And like this, this is really out of my comfort zone. Uh-huh. <laughs> but just do it, and it's good. <laughs> Question for you: now, When you say take action, are you are you suggesting that you think it is a good idea to be buying property right now, or are you saying yes. take action? Okay. Look, like, oh, would you yeah, be buying in Ottawa? Would you be buying? Oh yeah. Okay. What are you looking for if you're deals. buying a deal now? Uh, right now, well, le- less competition, so that's nice. Instead of forty offers, we'll have twenty or or ten on a, on the same property. So, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I'm looking at multiplexes, so small, okay. like three to six units, or houses on the ravines to build in uh, basement suites. That's something I'm looking at in. Ottawa, the uh, the whole bungalow putting in a basement suite that's kind of being done by others. So I'm I'm changing it up. I'm going to do bigger houses with a, a basement apartment. Yeah, we'll got to find your niche. Got to find yes. your niche. No, I like that. <laughs> I, I I'm a big believer in that too. Having a niche is uh, is huge uh, for for really carving out massive profits. Uh, you know, yes. sure you can join in and get like marginal profits, but if you want to get massive massive profits, get creative. Uh, because, exactly. But be creative once you know what you're doing. Once, once you got a good, uh, yeah. a good base. Yeah. So partner with someone. That's why joint yeah. ventures and all that. Yeah, absolutely. Not that we're giving advice here, but <laughs> no, <laughs> but, uh, okay. Francois, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. And, um, I'll look forward to, uh, to getting updates from you and seeing how you're doing. Thanks for watching today's episode. Just a friendly reminder to please rate and review this podcast on iTunes. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure that you smash the like and subscribe and notification bell. Uh, And also leave a comment. And hey, while you're at it, why not share this episode with somebody you think it could help? It helps this podcast grow and I would really appreciate it. Thanks again. We'll see you on the next episode.